brought the people out of the land of Egypt and was taking them into the promised land, they were going to get portions of the property as an inheritance. And you know that they were going to get those portions of property given to them by lot or divvied out. And depending upon the number of, of people within their tribe, they may get more and they may get less, um, just depending on the number of people and so forth that uh, God was blessed within that tribe. And so they were going to be given out uh, all of this property, but when you study it, you understand that uh, the Levites, they were not going to inherit pieces of that property. Now they were going to be given cities to live in, but they would not be given pieces of property because the Bible says the Lord was their inheritance. There were cities given to them, and then Within and around those cities, there were six specific cities that are mentioned in uh, Numbers chapter 35, and uh, they are called the cities of refuge. Numbers chapter 35, and in verse 6, the Bible says, And among the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites, so again, in reference to that, they were given cities, but not property as their inheritance. There shall be six cities for refuge which ye shall appoint for the manslayer, that he may flee thither, and to them ye shall add forty and two cities. Now this is just talking about forty and two cities for the Levites to dwell in, besides these uh, six cities of refuge. And then you notice in verse 11 of the same chapter, the Bible says, Then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any persons at unawares, or that means it was not intentional. There was an accidental death that took place, and um, the individual did kill. We may say the difference between manslaughter and murder. It was unintentional, but there was a death involved. And so if the individual caused the death of another, he would flee to this city of refuge. That's a city of protection. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge, verse 12, from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. And so an individual kills somebody. It's not intentional, but it is manslaughter. And then uh, somebody in uh, the kinfolk of the person that got uh, killed wants to avenge and take their life. The you know eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing. But this is a provision within the law in case the person was not found guilty of murder. So they go to the city of refuge until those that are able to make judgment within that city hear the cause and make judgment. Verse 13, And of these cities, which ye shall give six cities, shall ye have for refuge. 
ye shall give three cities on this side Jordan, and three cities shall ye give in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. Now, just very briefly on that behalf, you know, as the tribes were going in, the uh, two and a half tribes said, we want to stay on this side of Jordan, this side of Jordan. They would all cross over to the other side of Jordan, but two and a half tribes says, we want our inheritance here. And uh, Moses heard the cause and granted that, and then the other uh, tribes went uh, to the other side of Jordan. Well, then there were six cities, three on each side of Jordan, to provide cities of refuge. Now, verse 15, again, same chapter. These six cities shall be a refuge, both for the children of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that everyone that killeth any persons unaware or unintentional may flee thither. So this is the, the provision and the regulations for the cities of refuge, for a manslayer who kills uh, another without intention. Six cities, three on that side where the majority of the tribes went, three on this side where the minority of the tribes went, but they had them on each side. And so the idea was that everyone could have a city of refuge within distance. And if you uh, kind of read history, maybe Jewish history, the thought was within a day's travel that they could. And it, it could be within a Sabbath day's travel, which you could only go so many furlongs and so forth, so many steps on uh, Sabbath day, or it was considered a work. And that was to make it there before the avenger of blood caught them to take their life. Now, the application for this, going into the New Testament, because we look at Christ concealed in the Old Testament and Christ revealed in the New Testament. When Christ makes the blanket statement, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. And then in, in Luke, he is speaking to the two on the road to Emmaus and so forth, and beginning at the the Psalms, the Law, the Prophets, he, ex he expounded, that's expository preaching, if you will, in, in all the Psalms, Prophets, about the things concerning him. And that would be uh, a long message. That would be expository preaching from Christ. And so you have to understand from a statement like that that these things pertain to or are pictures of or types of things that are going to be revealed in the New Testament. And so the application is that you and I have, uh, for lack of better words, uh, committed murder in the killing of Christ. Now, unknowingly, you didn't know that as a young person. Until you reach the age of accountability, you don't know that you have to get saved. Until the age of accountability, you're covered. It's under the blood. After the age of accountability, you're responsible. For him to know it's to do good and do it not to him it is sin. It's accounted unto him for sin. When you knowingly reject Christ, when you knowingly can accept Christ, that's why we don't baptize babies. We don't sprinkle babies. We don't do any sprinkling. But we don't baptize babies. They have to make a conscious choice to accept Christ as personal Lord and Savior. But the point is, the Bible says, there's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sin and come short of the glory of God. So when an individual comes to the age of accountability, they have to uh, come to this realization that their sin and all people's sin is responsible for putting Christ on the cross. And so it, in that sense, Christ had to die for our sins. Christ was made uh, sin for us. He that knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Christ in him. And so Christ died on the cross to pay our sin debt. That means we were guilty. And we are guilty of the blood. We are guilty of uh, the death of Christ in that regards. John 3.18 puts it in this uh, framework where it says in John 3.18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so when there is the capacity to believe, that's the age of accountability. And when somebody has reached that age and they believe not, 
then they are condemned already. And so there is a condemnation. And with that thought, we have to run in that thought to the nearest city of refuge before the avenger of blood or death catches us. In our case, it is the devil that would love to take our life. And then our soul to hell because uh, we are guilty. We have to get to the city of refuge. The devil is hot, hot on your trail. David, I believe it was, said, there is but a step between me and death. And the devil is hot on the trail of an individual. And you and I have to get to the city of refuge and to, to live. And if we make it to that city of refuge, then we can stay in that city. And that was the thought in that city. Now notice this in Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, and again, the New Testament takes that Old Testament typology and applies it to Christ. You, you remember things like it says, and that rock that followed them was Christ. Amen. So there, there's a type. The rock that followed them was Christ. And when I see the blood all pass over you, and then the New Testament says Christ is our Passover, this is another one. And so those cities of refuge that everybody could get to, and they had to get to them before the avenger of blood got to them first. In Hebrews chapter 6 is where it makes this clear to us. We'll just pick up in verse 17. Hebrew is a very interesting book, and Hebrews chapter 6 is extremely interesting and uh, full of good information. In verse 17, the Bible says, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the word of God that we've read, asking that you would forgive me of my sins, fill me with thy spirit, help me to be able to preach and teach the word of God with truth without heresy and as it goes forward that it would land on fertile ground praying tonight dear Lord wherever the word of God is preached that the children of God would get exactly what they need that they would have a hunger and thirst for righteousness for the word of God and the souls will be saved please help us in Jesus name we pray for his sake amen and so we could just say from Hebrews chapter 6 and in verse 18 Christ, the Christian's refuge, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope uh, set before us. So Christ, uh, the Christian's refuge. Now, in this, we look at this and, and say for a, a lost individual, who are they attempting to take refuge in, like in this day and hour, and what's going on? And uh, then for the child of God, the Christian who is saved, born again, since Christ is their refuge, are they running to Christ? Or are they running to someone else, something else, for that refuge? All right, so Christ is our refuge the Christian refuge here's number one Christ is our protecting 
refuge. When you look back at the cities of refuge and then you fast forward into the New Testament and realize that they're talking about in typology to Christ, that Christ is our protecting refuge. And so like the person over here in the Old Testament that has killed somebody unintentional but knows they're in grave danger, they were instructed to run to the nearest city of refuge. And there was one there, probably within a day's journey, which direction that they went. Because if they were going to get caught before they reached the city, then the avenger of blood could take their life. And so the child of God runs to Christ for his protection. And in Christ, we are protected. Now, he protected Abraham, even when Abraham failed and faltered, you, you know about the difficulties that he got himself in. In verse 15 of chapter 6, the Bible uh, is speaking about uh, Abraham because it, it says in verse 13, if you go up, for when God made promise to Abraham, that's one of the immutable things of God, his promises, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. That's the oath. That's the two immutable things that he's talking about. The promises of God are immutable. He doesn't lie. He doesn't change his mind. And the oath that he made, and the oath that he made with Abraham, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now he's speaking about Abraham and this patient endurance. There is some things in life you just simply have to endure. And some of those things Abraham brought on himself. And I'm not going to divert and go into that. You understand that. But he was a sinner like you and I. Then he was a saved sinner like you and I. But he did some things that uh, were in the flesh, not the spirit. And if you walk in the spirit, you do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you walk and get diverted and walk in the flesh then you're not walking in the Spirit, and those kinds of things can happen. And so the Bible says, after he had patiently endured, sometimes he just had to patiently endure what he did to himself. And we're enduring those things as well. Uh, he obtained a promise. He obtained that promise of God, and God cannot lie, and he, he confirmed it with an oath. Verse 16, For men verily or truly swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Or taking an oath is what he's, he's talking about. Like if you were to go to court and have to uh, make a statement on the Bible. Well, God could not swear by any greater, so he swore by himself. That's the point. And then we began reading in verse uh, 17 and so forth. But he protected Abraham is what I'm saying. Even through... The things that he did that were wrong, if you read about Abraham and going down uh, to Egypt, if you will, and making kind of a half-truth about his wife, and if you read the storyline, God protected, and God did not allow uh, the other kings to take his wife in to their harem and those types of things. God protected. God interceded. And um, even when he faltered, it, it, even when he failed, so that's enduring, but Christ is our protecting refuge. He is our protecting refuge. Look at this in Isaiah chapter 25 for just a moment. You can hold your spot there. Isaiah chapter 25. In the storm, physical, spiritual, uh, Christ is our protecting refuge. He's the safe haven. He's the one to run to. He is like that city of refuge that you and I need to run to and to stay in and not come out of. In Isaiah chapter 25, and in verse 4, uh, the Bible says, For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. He is a refuge from the storm. That's what Christ is. He is a refuge in the storm. If you look at uh, Psalm chapter 9. Psalm chapter 9. In 
In Psalm chapter 9 and in verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And so he, he is a, a protecting refuge. We are protected from death. We are protected from Satan and his demons. We are protected in life. We are protected by the angels of God, the angels of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and deliver them. We are protected when the wrath of God is going to come. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. Uh, the Bible speaks about that there is a wrath that is to come. And it is coming, of course, and it's after the rapture takes place. There is going to be difficult times leading up to that point. But then the wrath of God uh, is going to be let loose, if you will. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, the Bible says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Past tense, when you got saved, you were placed in Christ, and you will be delivered from the wrath to come. That's why we are pre-tribulation. Now, if you look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, I said Christ is our protecting refuge. In Galatians chapter 1, and verse 4, uh, Christ will protect you from the world uh, if you'll let him. In, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, the world is responsible, if I could say that, for the demise of a lot of Christians. I'm not talking about their soul. I'm talking about their testimony. I'm talking about their abundant life after they get saved. Christ came to give you life and give you life how? More abundantly. An individual can get saved by the grace of God and then still allow the world to steal all of their joy, to get their testimony, to get them far away from God, to get them uh, taken away from the city of refuge. The city of refuge to a worldly child of God seems too constricting. The, it, it's too narrow, it's too straight, it's too binding. And, and the world, uh, Christ will protect you from the world if you'll let him. The world's not your friend. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says this, Who gave himself for our sins, talking about Christ, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. And... Christ can protect you from the world. And the average individual says, I don't even know what you mean by that. What, what do you mean that I need protected from the world? The, the world's not my home, we sing. We're just passing through. Uh, love not the world, neither the things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father's not in him. And so they're, they're diabolically opposed to each other. And so the, the child of God that looks around and says, I want to be saved, but I do want to be like the other nations, and I want to dress like, look like, go where, then that world is having an individual drawn away from the city of refuge. It, the, you're at enmity. The, the world is at enmity with God. And, and the world with its glitter and its glamour and all of its lights and things like that are an, an attention getter. And so for the child of God to say, it's Wednesday night Bible study, but it's a lot more interesting over here. And if the devil can use any of those things to get you distracted, then he's drawing you away from the city of refuge out to where he can get a hold of you. But if you will allow him, Christ will protect you from this present evil world. Now the Bible says it's the present evil world. It's, just, it's not somebody just making this up, it says, from this present evil world. God said that. And it's the world system. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. Now here's another one. I said Christ is our protecting refuge, and he will protect you from the world if you let him. But a whole lot of Christians leave that protection. They don't see anything wrong with it, and they're drawn away from the city, the city of refuge. All right, in, in Psalm chapter 37, verse 5. In Psalm chapter 37 and verse 5. If I could use this, and I would say that not only will Christ protect you from this world, but Christ will protect you from your way. Your way. We're, we're bent on our way. 
We're, we're wired that way. It's our way. We want our way. And you have, to set, you have to push the reset button and say, is my way the right way? Christ is the right way. And if you're going Christ's way, you are on the right way. He said he is the way. And that means there's other ways that are not the right way. In Psalm chapter 37 and verse 5, the Bible says, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Now that's something you have to do. I'm talking about after that you get saved. You commit your way. God, I want my way to be your way. I want your way to be my way. And I, I want to, as humanly as possible, that I know your way, your mind in this. This is what I want. This is what I want. If, you, if you'll let me know, this is what I want to do. And he, he will do that. So we can be protected from our way, which is typically contrary to his way because we are in flesh and we think humanistic thoughts. But if we will commit our way to God's way, then he will protect us. Not only that, but you already know this, we can be protected from our will, which is contrary to his will, if we will sincerely desire God's will. Over our, not my will, but thine be done. If you can really say it and mean it, then he can protect you from your will and make it his will. The Bible says in regards to that, it's in Psalm chapter 40 and verse 8 for a verse. The Bible says, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And so the Bible is in the heart of this psalmist, and it's David. And he says, because the Bible is in his heart, then that gives him a delight to do the will of God. I know God's right. God's always right. And I delight to do thy will. If you can say, I delight to do thy will, then uh, he will protect you from your own will. And your will is typically against his will. And if you don't know, then there's another portion of scripture in Psalm 143, which all of us have to refer to quite often in Psalm 143, and it's in verse 10. In Psalm 143 and verse 10, the Bible says, teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God, thy spirit is good, lead me into the land of uprightness. Teach me to do thy will. And if you're teachable, God will teach you to do his will. And if you're not, it's more difficult. Because God doesn't uh, like it when we're stubborn. We are even protected not only from the world and not only from our way and not only from our will, but we are protected from our worry if we'll give it over to him. And there's so many things to... Uh, get you worried and the devil likes to get you worried he can get you so worried you're sick you that we call it you worry yourself sick and then and then you you get to where you're not functional first peter 5 7 the bible says casting all your care upon him for he careth for you now i said christ is our protection when the individual realized that all of a sudden he he is he's killed somebody unawares and then he's already been taught he turns and runs for the city of refuge as fast as he can because he knows the avenger of blood is after him he had to stay in that city he was protected in that city and in typology when you are in Christ you are protected in the city protection leave the city no protection and the child of God has protection in Christ. There's, there's no doubt about it that if they get saved, they're in Christ. Praise God, they're going to heaven. But the individual gets to thinking in Christ is too straight. And the world, it seems to be the more broad way. And I like going that way. And that is the devil drawing you away from the city of protection or Christ. And even though that you are saved, you're in trouble. And you're leaving and going into unprotected territory when you leave Christ. 
when you leave Christ out of your life, when you leave that protection of the city, because without the city there was no protection. And there's children of God that are saved, born again, child of God, but currently do not want Christ having his will, his way in their life. And so they leave that umbrella of protection, saved and on their way to heaven, but no protection. In our, in our text, I say number two, and real quickly, that uh, in Hebrews chapter uh, 6, Christ is the Christian's refuge. He is the place of safety. And there, there is no other place. There is, there's no other person. And so you and I have to ask, and uh, when, when we do this, we don't look around and say, yeah, that Christian or that Christian and that so forth. We look in the mirror. James says we look in the Word of God as a mirror and say, me, who do I run to? What do I run to? And so it has to be to Christ. And he is our protective refuge. He's, he's the refuge of protection. And then number two, and quickly, Christ is our permanent refuge. In verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 6, the Bible says that by two immutable things, these are things that are not changing. They do not change. Just as God does not change. He doesn't change his mind in which it was impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie about these two immutable things. His promises and the oath that he makes. Uh, the main promise is what I'm talking about in this verse is salvation. That you run for salvation just as soon as you understand that you need to be saved. But you run to Christ after salvation as my city of refuge in all things. And it's who you run to that makes the difference. Christ and it is a permanent refuge. Two immutable things impossible for God to lie. When God said, I'll save you, he meant he'd save you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And uh, the oath that he says that he'll keep you saved. Uh, that no one can take you out of his hand. John 10, 29. The Bible says in verse 19 of this text, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. The anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast. You notice the language. It's repetitive to where you and I get it. And which entereth into within the veil. It's sure, it's steadfast, and it is an anchor. That's a permanent refuge. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, on that same line, uh, he is our permanent refuge. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, and in verse uh, 27, the Bible says, The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. That's God, eternal. He's the eternal God. He always was. And underneath are the everlasting arms, repetitive language, always able to hold, always able to keep, always able to deal with the enemies. And he says, destroy them. He has the power to say that. You and I do not have that power. God has that power. He is our permanent refuge. He's my anchor. He's the anchor of the soul. Praise God for that. The devil doesn't want you to know that. The devil doesn't want you to believe that. The devil wants to get on your back and get you to question that. Not only is Christ our protective refuge and permanent refuge, but I want to say that he is our pleasant refuge. Pleasant. It's, it's pleasant. It's a pleasant refuge. In, in Psalm 16, if you notice this, in Psalm 16, Christ is our pleasant refuge. He, he's the person of my refuge. He's the power of my refuge. He's the protection of my refuge. He's the permanence of my refuge, but he is my pleasant refuge. I like being with Christ. I like being in Christ. I like to walk with Christ. I like to talk with Christ. I like to go to church and meet with Christ. I like to open up the word of God and, and read the words of Christ. It's pleasant. 
in Psalm chapter 16, the Bible says in verse 5, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Now, we don't have time to develop every bit of those two verses. But it is in relation to what we were already talking about, that when they went in, they got certain portions of inheritance. And if you're reading through your Bible about now, and you see that in Joshua, it'll say the boundaries of this tribe was from here to here to here to here to here. And you're reading all of that, and you're trying to figure that out, and you got your map out and so forth, and you're trying to figure out who, where does Judah get to live, and uh, all these tribes. Now, I don't know, but I wonder if some of the tribes wouldn't have said, well, I would have rather had that spot. Man, that's oceanfront. How'd they get that? I bet you that's going to be worth a lot more 100 years from now. That's why they got it. You think they do that because they're people? Maybe. Now, do you ever do that? The psalmist is saying right here, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance. I'll give you another one. The Levites would go in and say, we don't get anything. Will you get God? Yeah. Yeah. Will you get all those sacrifices they bring to you? You don't have to. You get fed? Yeah. You get cities? Yeah. You get what I'm talking about? But we didn't get the oceanfront property. Maybe Dan got that. Family reunion. He says, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance. Child of God, you start looking around and you're thinking, well, what did I get? Well, you got Jesus and you got salvation and anything above and beyond that is hallelujah shouting ground. Amen. Now listen to me. He says, and my cup. Now you think about the cup and you, you know about the Lord's cup. You think about your cup. Thou maintainest my lot. And that's what he's talking about. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Thank you, Lord. You, you've got this. You, you've got it all. You're not going to cheat me. Didn't cheat them. He won't cheat you. Here are the lines. This is what you've gotten. And it's pleasant. It's, I, I love going to church. I love reading the Bible. I love getting to pray. I love being a child of God. I love those lines that he's got laid out. And that's fair. Amen. Praise God for that. That's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, I've got a goodly heritage. There's no complaining. He's a pleasant refuge. Uh, the Lord has delivered us. He's dealt kindly with us. He's given us the promise. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be you suffer with him, ye shall reign with him. Nothing to complain about. Christ gives the reward according to the portion. And when they went in, if that tribe was bigger, they get the more. And if you make spiritual application to that, it's like this. Do you, do you want to serve God more? You can. Do you, want, do you want more? You can have it. He said, open my mouth wide and what? I'll fill it. He that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And one day there is a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. And there'll be a goodly heritage. You remember all that stuff about all these lines and what was given out and so forth? That's what we were talking about. Step up. Pleasant, pleasant refuge. It's not unpleasant to serve God. It's not unpleasant to go to church. It's not unpleasant to read your Bible. It's not unpleasant to witness. By the grace of God, it is pleasant. The world's not pleasant. The Bible says to deliver you from this present evil world. That's not pleasant. This is pleasant. 
in the eyes of God. And then uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, he is our personal refuge. He is our personal refuge. You have to make it personal. You have to make Christ personal. In Hebrews and in chapter 6, you make this personal. When the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, that he's my anchor, and he's your anchor. There is no other anchor. Wherever that you're running to, or whatever you're counting on, or whoever you're counting, or whatever, that's not your anchor. Christ is your anchor, and he is your hope, both sure and steadfast, now watch this, and which entereth into that within the veil, as Christ entered into the veil, and not without blood, as a sacrifice, and in, in the veil was the presence of God, the personal presence of God getting in the veil, and without was the outer court, and those that wanted to stay on the fringe, the outer court, we're okay out here. But somebody wanted to get in, into the inner veil, into the, the presence of God. And they could. Christ went in, providing the new and the living way. That's why the veil of the temple was rent in twain. To provide that entering in that you and I could approach in the Holy of Holies. And an individual has to say, I want that. Or an individual can say, that's just too deep for me. It's a personal refuge. Just how close do you want to get to Christ? How far do you want to go with Jesus? In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19, the Bible says, which entereth into that within the veil. Entering into that within the veil was getting into the very presence of God. And whenever that you get into the presence of God, then Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 13 will not be a problem for you. We'll end on this for the time has come to end. The Bible says, verse 13, verse 13, let us, as a child of God, go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Hebrews 13.13 13 is possible because of Hebrews 6.19. When you get in the veil, in the presence of God, when it is pleasant to you, then you'll have no problem going without the camp, bearing his reproach. But people don't want to go to Hebrews 13, 13, outside the camp, bearing his reproach, because they've never been into Hebrews 6, 19, within the veil, in the presence of God where he, he's my protector and he'll protect me from that world. Where I see him permanent, I see him pleasant and I accept him personally. Christ, our refuge. The Christian's refuge is Christ. It's who you run to or what you run to. And it should be Jesus. He's the only one that can fully protect us from the evil one. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the word of God that we have before us. Thank you, dear Lord, that you are our refuge, the anchor for our soul. And we run to you. Help us now, dear Lord realize just how pleasant you are and make it personal to our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. 322. Let's stand and take our hymn book, turn to page 322, and we'll sing a verse or two of invitation.
page 322, Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus, the life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing. Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne, my life I give henceforth to live. O Christ, for Thee alone. On that last. Living for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, the light of His smile, seeking the lost ones He died to redeem. Bringing the weary to find rest in Him. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne, my life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Thank you so much for being at Calvary Baptist Church for midweek service. We do appreciate you so much. And uh, please continue to pray for those on the prayer list and those that are not feeling well. Brother Farmer, would you close us in a word of prayer, please? Lord Jesus, we do lift up those that are uh, sick and uh, need healing. Lord, we pray that you'd help them, give them strength. Lord, we thank you for this service. We thank you for the words that you brought to us. Help us uh, to uh, live uh, close to that veil, close to you. Lord, that we'd be to, uh, close to your side. Help us uh, as we walk our Christian lives. Help us to apply the words that we've heard to our hearts, live them daily as you'd have us to. Lord, we pray for uh, those that are sick. We pray for this country. We pray that you'd watch over and keep us safe until the next appointed time. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Pray for each other.